Good afternoon. My name is Adela Pineda, and I am the director of the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies here at UT Austin. And um, it is a pleasure to be here today uh, with a group of uh, journalists, reporters, um, who put together a wonderful series of uh, a series, uh, five episode podcast series known as Line in the Land um, about the Haitian Odyssey migration from Haiti to the United States. Um, I need to thank um, my longtime friend and colleague, Yvette Benavides, uh, who is a professor and a writer and a journalist um, who made the connection possible. Um, I also want to thank Paloma Diaz, who is the assistant director of scholarly programs um, for organizing the logistics of the event. Um, I will be introducing Sofia Sanchez, who will be the moderator of the roundtable. Um, and she um, here reports and produces for Texas Public Radio's Border and Immigration Desk. She has reported local news for several um, magazines and journals, the Galena Gazette. Previously, she worked at Foreign Policy, where she produced Doha Debates for Correction and Latino USA, where she profiled immigrant authors, journalists, and musicians. Sofia's writing on race and identity has also been recognized and published by the American Studies Association. She comes to San Antonio from small town Galena in Illinois, and she graduated from Northwestern University's Medical School of Journalism in 2021. So welcome, Sofia. Before I give you the word, I want to say why um, these type of events are important for leaders, for our We think that academic programs, academic research and teaching should always be connected to what is urgent in the world and in Latin America. And no better way to do that by connecting to journalists and reporters who are at the forefront of what is urgent today in Latin America. Um, this topic is of, of primary importance for our um, actuality. And therefore, I thank them for being here. So, welcome, Sofia, and thank you. And I'm going to turn off my camera for a little Thank you so much, Dr. Pineda. I really, really appreciate it. On behalf of Texas Public Radio and the Houston Chronicle, thank you so much for having us. And I wanna start by not only thanking Dr. Pineda, but also um, Paloma Diaz and everybody else at Lilas Benson and UT Austin ha that has worked to put this incredible event together. So thank you so much for that. Um, and before we jump into things, I also wanna encourage viewers listening on Facebook, watching on Facebook to comment and comment their questions. And then I believe um, Paloma will be copying and pasting those into the chat so that we can read them aloud throughout the process or at the at the end of this event. So definitely type those in there. Um, and to begin, I wanna give you um, an introduction to who we have joining us today, the rest of the team that helped put together Line in the Land and La Linea podcast. So I'm gonna start with Joey. Um, he's the local government reporter at Texas Public Radio and he is based in San Antonio, Texas. He was the, and continues to be the co-host of Line in the Land. Um, next, we have Stefania Corpi, who is a freelance journalist who focuses on migration, human rights, and other underreported issues. She's based in Mexico City, and she is she was also in the um, English version, Line in the Land, but she is the co-host of the Spanish version, La Línea, and also one of the lead reporters and writers for both. And finally, we have Elizabeth Trovall, the immigration reporter at Houston Chronicle. And she's based in Houston, Texas, and she is co-host of the English version. She's co-host of the Spanish version, also lead, in, lead reporter and writer um, for the English version. So thank you so much for everyone for being here. Um, and I wanna start now by giving you a little bit of a background about the podcast. I hope many of you have been keeping up with us each Wednesday as we release each episode. But if not, um, Line in the Land is about 16,000 Haitians that arrived in Del Rio, Texas in September of last year. The humanitarian crisis was 
making international headlines, but the unlikely spectacle at the Texas-Mexico border was just a glimpse of an immigration journey like no other. It's one that extends more than 10,000 miles from the rubble of the 2010 Haitian earthquake through South America and all the way to Del Rio and the Houston suburbs. And so um, this story is, uh, it's a story of migration. Um, and I wanna start by how this kind of came together um, because it starts with movement in that I actually moved to Texas to help tell this story. As Paloma said, I am from Chicago, Illinois, rural Illinois, um, not Texas. And when I got the call from Texas Public Radio that they were coming up with this idea to reintroduce America to the border and immigration issues, they were envisioning a project that was um, to tell the migration story through a more character-driven lens. I knew I wanted to be a part of it. And um, what this series, um, I hope, has interrogated is the conception of the border as this straight and narrow hardline process, when really there are a lot of figurative and literal gaps in maintaining this border that I hope that we have tried our best to provide information about and in blur. So with that, um, moving into the scope of this story of movement and migration, um, and how we traveled from Texas to Colombia, to Chile, to Haiti, and back to Texas. Um, I wanna start by asking all the reporters where they came into the story and understanding how you three entered the story. So Joey, um, I was introduced to you first. So I would love to hear about where you came in to Line in the Land. Joey, you're muted. <laughs> My apologies. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah, we're on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so I came into this story that these thousands of people were facing at what many saw as potentially a roadblock or a stepping stone in some cases for some of their journey. And that was when 16,000 people arrived in Del Rio. You know, they had spent the last 10 years or so traveling through from, from Haiti into South America, into Mexico, and many of them ended up right on the border between Acuna and Del Rio. Just thousands of people underneath this bridge. And that became such a like boiling point for the country as People were just laser focused and watching everything that was happening in Del Rio. And one of the most interesting parts of this is that these weren't the type of folks you normally see coming to the border. Uh, these are black migrants from Haiti. And the driving question is there, why? What was happening? And all of that is so excellently reported through Elizabeth and through Stephania as these the journeys these folks have gone through is 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 cataloged and reported for people to be able to hear. And Joey, um, so you were actually the person that kind of introduced me to Stefania eventually, because as um, we know, this is a collaboration between Texas Public Radio and the Houston Chronicle. So we have some some questions to answer about how we all met. And Stefania, when did you come into this story? Well, I was I was actually following the Haitian story because the National Guard in Mexico was committing a lot of abuses in the southern border. So there was a lot of Haitian already Haitian migrants um, established in Tapachula. So I was supposed to go to the southern border early September. And then a friend of mine who also covers migration called me uh in our national holiday which is not Cinco de Mayo it's the 16th of September uh <laughs> Independence Day um I was I was taking pictures of a of a midwife uh childbirth um and we just we were trying to figure out how to get to Acuña and we arrived there the 17th of September and La Cortina the famous curtain uh was already closed um, it was like people, like TVP was already closing that, that crossing. The next day we we're just a few people. Um, 
Reuters had already been there, Gona Kamura, which is an amazing photojournalist. So we were trying to decide what to do with the story and I ended up staying for 10 days. So they took everyone to Salon Fandango. Um, it, was, it was a roller coaster. <laughs> um, and how did, you, how did you get connected to Texas Public Radio? Um, if you could explain that. Throughout those 10 days, I did a writing, I did some writing for uh, another outlet. I did photographing for BuzzFeed News and I did, um, and a friend of mine told me they need someone to do some audio for this radio station in Texas. I didn't know anything about Texas Public Radio. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, you know that. <laughs> And I had this call with Dan and Fernanda and we ended up having like a 45 minute call. This was when they were already in the park. People were already in the park and they were being harassed by Mexican officials. So I worked the last three days for Texas Public Radio and that's where I met one of our <laughs> That's where you met Joe. Uh, I didn't meet Joe. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I didn't meet anyone from Texas Public Radio. I, oh, I think we, okay. I exchanged messages with someone from Texas Public Radio. It was probably Joey. Yeah, it was Joey. Okay. <laughs> um, um, and then finally, we have Elizabeth Troval from the Houston Chronicle, who um, I believe was having also coffee with Fernanda and um was talking about how they had both been following the similar stories and decided to come together elizabeth if you could kind of explain how you got connected to the story and how we ended up collaborating together um well i think i really started following this migration story out of haiti in 2010 after the earthquake um, when i was living in chile actually because there was suddenly a large number of patients coming there for the first time and then in, um, I think, July of last year, um, I interviewed some Haitians that had been making their way up through the Darien Gap in Colombia and explaining just this dreadful journey that they were taking. And so this journey was really on my radar um, a bit. And then suddenly, you know, there's this massive people that we're seeing images under the bridge in Del Rio, Texas. And it was, I think my, it was like my fourth week, my first month at work at the Chronicle and um, just kind of jumped in my car once we saw the image and on the 16th um, got there and started, you know, interviewing people straight away and pitched a podcast to the Chronicle and um, then got TPR involved when I pitched um, I pitched some stories to them and they were like, well, why don't we just join forces if you're doing a podcast for them? Let's just all do it together, which worked out fantastically. Yes, I think so, too. Um, and I would love to know. So you mentioned that I think both you and Joey did mention that this was a scene unlike either of you had seen before. Um, Stefania, as somebody that has been following the story for a long time too, was this a scene that you had seen before? How is this different from other migration stories that you had told? I think I think it was the amount of people. Um, I remember these uh, shelters in Pacaraima, the, the border between the border between Venezuela and Brazil, and you could see um, several migrant camps throughout the border, um, Guavista, and and like thousands of them, thousands of Venezuelans established there, but the, the, not, not these amount of people together, you know, I, that, that's what it was shocking. I was not, I was never in Del Rio because I, I was gonna be crossing it illegally. Uh, the bridge was closed and I don't have a journalist visa to work, uh, to work in that area. Uh, I think only a few people were able to get inside the camp before it was closed, which was the first days, who were entering through the Rio, yeah, through the the Rio side. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it was amazing just to see them crossing to get food, you know, <laughs> because it was less expensive to buy them in pesos than dollars. 
um, to get water and the conditions they were in, like the, 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 the stories were nerve wracking. It, it, was, it was just too much. And Elizabeth, uh, um, you had mentioned that you've been following the story for almost, I mean, basically years. What was it that drew you to the story that made you even want to pitch a podcast? What was it that like emotionally connected you to this um, as a long-term <laughs> project? Um, I feel like there was just a lot of these images of, of Haitians like in this camp and um, I like their stories that they told me the journeys they had gone on were just, I mean, heartbreaking, but also gave you a lot of hope and just kind of left me in awe. And um, I just felt like this is a really cross continental story. And, you know, I think what's missing oftentimes in uh, immigration stories is telling the story from where the migration begins and this and, and also how policies in other countries, immigration policies in other countries can end up affecting what we see at the US-Mexico border. And so also connecting the dots to, um, you know, massive um, disaster like the earthquake, but also shifts in policy and anti-immigrant sentiment, for example, in Chile. And Elizabeth, as you were um, writing, especially the first episode, what was, what was it that you wanted to make sure was communicated about um, the situation that was different from, you know, beyond the scope of the, the story? Um, what was it that really, um, that, that you knew you needed to paint in the first episode? I think really communicating like these are folks coming not directly from Haiti, but they're actually coming from Latin America, I, you know, um, Chile in large part, um, which was a bit miscommunicated, I think, at the jump um, with some of the news coverage. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, and, and also just like the humanity of it all, right? Um, these are families and people who also believed that this, what they were doing was okay. Um, they really didn't believe like, oh, I'm breaking a law or I'm not, they, they thought that they had an open invitation um, actually. And there was misinformation about um, the border and what they would face. And they were also really, just how we were surprised, they were surprised to see so many people and they were surprised by the treatment um, where the US is flying Haitians um, back to Haiti who haven't lived there and even flying Haitian and Brazilian citizens um, to Haiti. And I think something um, kind of breaking the fourth wall for the audience a little bit, but when we do develop a podcast, um, we're thinking about what's the best way to communicate everything that we have learned over the past months, often years. And so Joey was really, um, he had been at the kind of the breaking news scene, but we needed someone that could kind of um, Break down the questions and dissect uh, the story from a um, from an average listener's view. And so, Joey was asking the questions. You'll find that if you listen to the podcast, he's kind of pointing out certain things that we really need to digest. Take a, a second moment to digest. Um, and when Elizabeth or Stefania are explaining things that they witnessed firsthand and that they have been following for years. So, my question to you, Joey, is: What have um, you know as a break? you're often covering more local government stories, breaking news stories. What is it that um, you learned or also like questions that you had that you made sure you wanted to ask when um, we were creating this podcast? You know, I, I spent a good part of uh, the beginning of my career as a breaking news reporter covering things that were just happening out of nowhere. Um, and so what we saw in Del Rio was exactly that. It was something that just had been building up under the scenes for such a long time and then just came to this boiling point in a town where I think there's probably double the number of people that live in that city that that were under the bridge. And so the, and I can't remember the exact number, but one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we really highlighted through this broadcast is that, you know, migration is not an A to B journey for people. You know, for us, if we're traveling somewhere, um, you know, start your your origin point, you get to your destination, do what you need to do, and you end up going back home. But for a lot of people, 
that are making this this journey that as we see in line of the land, the, excuse me, line in the land, they sometimes have to face these setbacks and they're monumental setbacks that are just completely out of their control, whether that be government mandates, whether that be uh, crimes that they face, uh, not crimes that they commit, but crimes that are done to them, um, or the, how do I phrase this? The, the type of, of a set of um, sentiment that we see of, nativists in countries that don't want other people in there. And so the podcast does touch a lot about that. And it shows that some of the same things that we see here in the U.S., um, some of the um, more uh, go-home type of, of, of people, that that's seen in South America as well. And I think for some folks that they, they don't realize that that happens. And the people that are profiled in this podcast uh, experience that throughout their journey. And so that's one of the things that we were really hoping to be able to show that this is a very, very difficult journey for people who felt they had no other choice than to leave everything that they had known to start over elsewhere and the journey that it takes to get there. It's not just as easy as hopping a plane and coming to the US. You know, they had to start elsewhere in trying to get here. And in some cases, that, you know, their final destination of the US, you know, they spent years in Brazil, they spent years in Chile, or they finally got here and then were taken into the country. When they're in these detention centers, some of them are sent back on planes, as Elizabeth mentioned, to Haiti. And they didn't realize that this was happening. So they end up all the way back to where they started after this journey that has taken, for in some cases, a decade. And so that's, that's really what we wanted to show people. Like, this yeah. is what people experience. Yeah, I think um, something important that you were touching on is that this this is a story that cannot be boiled down to one day as often um, a lot of news stories are and just the way that the breaking news cycle works. Um, often something happens, there's a max, mass exodus, you hear that there's 16,000 people under a bridge, your news director sends you there and then, you know, a day, a week, a month later, everybody's gone because the time has passed. But what we really wanted to emphasize was that there are people that uh, the, the people that ended up there and that we that a lot of news outlets took a day to explain is a story that transcends time that has transcended borders and has taken um, years for them to, to get to that point. So, um, Stefania, um, I, I would like to ask you about, you know, you had been following one of our main um, people, uh, Dashka, who is a Haitian woman. She had lived in Chile for a couple of years. Um, if you could talk to us about your relationship with her and the importance of coming back after breaking news cycles have ended. Yeah, so it was, it was really shocking for me to go back after those almost 10 days that I spent in Acuna and seeing all like, you couldn't find a room in the hotel and then there was nobody, right? It was still this, almost 1500 people waiting for their papers to be processed to have a legal status in Mexico. And the, the, I think that the shelter was flooded for two or three times. It was already cold. Uh, children were super sick and they had no idea where they were going to put them. So um, when I went back, I was the only journalist who had been there. Uh, this was November 2nd. Um, then again, Dia de Muertas. Um, and, uh, and, and that was, was only that was only a few weeks after a the, month, almost a month, yeah, probably six weeks after. And and they were completely abandoned. Nobody cared. It was it was a gossip between who owned the land where they were established and if there was something politic, like politics going on. Um, 
but nobody nobody really followed through the the story or the characters that the people that they were following the 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 stories that the people that they had access to and established a relationship um i have a couple of friends who did but only through whatsapp they they never went back so it was people were really mad at me when i arrived they didn't want to talk to me i mean except for dashka of course but it, they they were they were kind of um insulted you know that we were there we were trying to take pictures of them and and then we left so i guess that, that's something about haitian history too that 2010 people were there and then they left they left a mess too un were, was there they left a mess um aid was there they left a mess everybody left a mess like all these white people who arrived never helped them and i was one of them you know, I represented that throughout those four days. So it was a very hostile moment. Um, and I, I think it was good that I <laughs> lived through that because I it really shocked me and taught me how to um, not raise a camera, not be around when you're not needed and wanted and how to be more, um, when you cover migration and these situations, uh, you're not always wanted and and it's okay <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah you have to give people space and 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 it was it was i think in the end something happened and UNHCR and people from mexican agencies were there so i was able to report on that so we have that in, in our story um and you know it was it was great that i went back but it's it's also this like caravans like people right, there's one right now and I've seen thousands of tweets and people covering, but then what, what's gonna happen with those people? You know, I, I think like we need to start doing more uh, deep stories thought, like where we kind of um, keep up. Yeah, and, and have a relationship with people because in the end, if we keep talking about numbers, then there's nothing in those, uh, yeah. And so I think that our story is one of those endeavors, one of those pursuits in trying to establish a long term relationship. And I know it's something that you value as a journalist personally as well. So what, um, how did going back to um, Dashka in November, how did that affect your relationship and also the story, uh, telling her story? Yes, I think that kind of uh, opened a whole different, like we met, we had a good relationship, we kind of clicked, you know, like kind of when you're dating, when you had a first date and you're, you kind of like each other and then you're like, yeah, I want to have a second date. So, <laughs> so we had a second date, which was November and we had fun and she opened to me, right? She, she told me stories that you probably wouldn't have told me if I didn't go back mm -hmm. uh, about her mother and... Uh, her family situation and her dreams and hopes and who she is and 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 this is something that also people tend to forget you're not saving anyone this is this, these are people who have uh who also want to go and like stay on a couch and watch tv you know and <laughs> be lazy for one day um I, I don't know so she opened to me and we kept in touch and then something wonderful happened and we we stayed in touch and yeah i, I can't <laughs> but yeah but it's it, like i the last time we talked uh she called me her friend which is for a lot of journalism people would be a, like breaking a barrier but it's like come on she, we're, we're opening to each other you know it's a, it's a give and take yeah i think um it's important to also let the audience know that oftentimes there's this um, expectation for journalists to be very emotionally closed off and to kind of keep um, your eye objectively on the story. And so often when we open our hearts to the people that we have been dedicating our time to, our um, months to, and we tell the audience how much we really care about them, we're often called um, biased. And so I think um, this story will really show everybody that there's even more truth to be unblurred and told when there is that relationship. And 
Elizabeth, you also traveled to a lot of places for this story. I would love to know where you went, um, if you could talk to us about where you went physically and virtually um, and emotionally for the story as you also traveled throughout South America and throughout Latin America. Um, yeah, I was able to travel to uh, the Darien Gap, um, which is this gap in the Pan American Highway between um, kind of crossing, connecting, it's like a stitch um, or a lack of a stitch between uh, Panama and Colombia. And um, it's, you know, the known as kind of the most perilous part of the journey. Um, you're in a very secluded forested area with um, like dozens of rivers um, that frequently wash people away when they try to cross them. I did not make that journey. I just went to like the base camp kind of at the start of, of where the, the Darien Gap begins, um, you know, which was a flight to uh, Medellin and then Monteria and then a drive to Nicocli and then a boat from Nicocli to Akandi <laughs> um, uh, and um, then a, a, a horse ride, a buggy ride um, to the camp and that's where I met um, Jean Jean Baptiste, um, a Haitian man who was traveling um, to the US um, from Brazil, actually. And there were many Haitians at the camp, also Venezuelans, um, Syrians who would, you know, by way of Venezuela. Um, and, um, and I was able to follow Jean Jean Baptiste, um, and at least virtually. Um, when he made it to you know Costa Rica and then Monterrey, Mexico, and then now um, Reynosa, and um, so uh, you know I was also able to go back to Acuna in November and um, you, you know see this kind of the the people who were left behind and and interview folks and um, uh, it was very. Um, it was it was very tense, definitely incredibly tense, and you can understand why um, there there was a you know a lot of des desperation and and like Stephania said once again, um, people kind of just walking away, right? Um, they were left behind. And um, you know, uh, Joey talked earlier about how there's this rhetoric that he called it a like go back rhetoric and we can be honest it's racism it's xenophobia and it's white supremacy that creates this rhetoric um that also mixed in with um you know this this idea that um stephanie and elizabeth were just talking about about when we do give people attention as reporters it's often limited so i'm wondering elizabeth how you saw how you approached um, this dynamic as a reporter, as also somebody that cares about the people that you have been following for a long time, how you approached this as you were writing and what um, difference you think it would have made if you hadn't gotten back um, or if you hadn't kept up with the people that you had initially met. Well, um, I mean, it serves the story to, you know, the more you can stay in touch with people. Um, I frequently do, even if I know I'm probably not going to write a story, I try to keep in touch with people. Um, yes, there's a personal element of, of, of friendship that sometimes develops. Um, people are sharing with you really traumatic events in their lives too. So I, I think it's just a part of like respecting another human being. Um, and, and just showing compassion. Um, uh, yeah, I, <laughs> a question, but um, I'm actually going to dive into it in a little bit, so we'll come back to it. Um, and you know, we were talking about the Darien Gap, which, as um, Elizabeth talked about, is a little. It's um, a strip of land, a jungle that doesn't have um, many, doesn't have infrastructure for people to 
travel safely through. So that means, like she said, a lot of people end up dying on their way to finding safety. Um, and what I want to talk about now is also the figurative gaps that we hold as a team um, in trying to translate the story to everyday people. And so I also want to, again, put out there that we created two podcasts, one in English and one in Spanish, um, Line in the Land and La Línea. And I think what's really special about this is that they're not direct translations. Um, we made sure to kind of cultivate them for a Latin American audience and an American audience. And um, as I said before, Elizabeth was the main writer for the English version and um, Stefania was the main writer for the Spanish version. And Stefania, um, as a native Spanish speaker and um, also, the, you know, the lead Spanish writer, what was important to you to communicate in the Spanish version? Um, I just also want to say that we decided as a team to go through with this idea because we wanted to make sure that information was accessible to the people that we were reporting on. Obviously, um, Creole is, Spanish is not the, the, the primary language for Haitian people, but we do um, interact with a lot of Latin American and South American Spanish speaking countries along the way. And Stefania as being the only native speaker um, on this team, what was important to you again to make sure was translated or properly communicated to um, a Spanish speaking audience? Um, I think the, the last decade, Latin America was a uh, region, continent of origin, you know, it was never a destination. And now more and more with, with the Venezuelan migration, Nicaraguans going to Costa Rica, Venezuelans throughout the South America, Haitians who were in Chile, Brazil, uh, even extra regionals who were, who were going from Senegal, trying to reach Brazil and then also crossing the Darien Gap. Um, it's it's moving a lot. So um, we needed, I think I needed to kind of make it um, have a language that was first positive, that kind of included words that has, that made migration something that's in everyday's lives. Uh, what do I mean by that? Kind of, it, 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 it impacts everyone. And, and I, I have migrated, you know, I have been, in Peru and Costa Rica, and I, I was also a migrant. And mm -hmm. I think we all have someone who's living somewhere else. So mm -hmm. by that idea, I think the language that I was trying to use every time that I was kind of writing a line or translating or kind of like how would, would someone in Argentina would listen to this and the sense that they would have. Um, it was a challenge because sometimes you just can't. <laughs> um, uh, but it, I think it, it turned out amazing. I mean, a lot of the research was, and, and, and half of the reporting for the Spanish version, because this uh, the Spanish version has a lot of Dashka, um, was made by Elizabeth. So it was, her, her, her reporting is amazing. So thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was great to put together those, those ideas, you know? Um, yeah, I think, I think in, it turned out great. Yeah, I think something that's really special about um, the team that we have here is that Elizabeth had been following, um, you know, and correct me if this isn't fair, Elizabeth, but I feel like you had gotten like the larger scope of the story by going to Colombia and to Panama and um, also being in Houston, you had been able to follow the story through different physical and um, you know, figurative spaces. And so when that, or when uh, Stefania came into the picture and she was able to, you know, stay in touch and focus on one person's story, I think together we created a very, you know, dynamic specific, but all specific, but specific, but also nuanced story. And um, I would love for everybody um, to talk about, you know, if they could talk about a limitation that they had during this process and oh. how you approached that beyond language barriers. <laughs> um, uh, 
just I think none of us is black. So that's something you just can feel, you know, like when Dashka told me that she was missing the products that she needed. That that's something I never that never occurred to me, you know? Her and products. that's the her products. Her products, like body lotion that she needed. Um and that's just my ignorance, you know, um, because I didn't even think about those things. So I, that that's something that I think I should, that I kind of like want to think about next time. Um, and I think, well, I mean, Elizabeth and Joy, you can jump in um, and talk about also how, you know, you approach those limitations, because that, that's something that that's a conversation we all actively had that our team, you know, had this was a shortcoming on behalf of the team and that none of us are black or Haitian. Um, there were no black or Haitian reporters working with us, but the way that we tried to mitigate that was by um, consulting Dr. Miriam Chassi, who is a professor at um, Scripps College. She's a Haitian Canadian woman who specifically focuses on Haitian, US Haitian relations. And um, it was Elizabeth's idea. She suggested working, you know, with an expert that could provide us this, or at least help mitigate this um, ignorance. Um, and I, you know, I'm wondering, Elizabeth, if you were going to say that or if um, you were gonna say something else. Um, I felt like there was a lot of, I kind of felt like at every turn there were, there were obstacles um, and there wasn't, um, I mean, I'm actually going to borrow words from the photographer I worked with, um, Maria Jesus, who's a brilliant photographer um, and covers immigration. Um, just, you know, she was talking about in her many years covering the border, um, there is with, you know, Central Americans, for example, um, there is a relationship with media, um, existing and existing trust with media. I'm not I'm not saying it's a perfect relationship at all, but um, but a relationship exists. And um, I felt like there were cultural differences, but also a lack of trust um, in in Del Rio um, at, or you know at at the river um, in Acuna um, that made it very difficult for people to open up. It's obviously a really difficult situation too, um, but I think it was a little more, there was a little more tension with media than um, is typical. Um, and I felt like, yeah, not having the cultural tools, not having been to Haiti, not having, I didn't know the history of Haiti. I mean, it was, it was just very new experience. Um, but I also think that like that's true of a lot of Texans and the story was happening, you know, in Texas. And so um, hopefully it's an eye opening podcast for people who were ignorant about um, these things like I was. So I, I hope that that blindness to some things actually was a tool to, to educate. Shall we? Yeah, <clears throat> just bouncing off what Elizabeth said, I mean, that's the whole perspective of this podcast is to take people into the lives that are living this, that are making the journey, that are traveling, you know, these hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles uh, to get where they feel they could have the best possible chance at a prosperous life. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's just simply not an easy task, but these people are faced with it being their only option to leave. And so, you know, I, I am glad that we have uh, someone like Dr. Chaussey who is able to help us go into that perspective, someone who, who is Haitian, who is who knows the struggles and experience, because that's just such an important voice uh, and, and perspective in being able to tell this story and and let people know what these folks have gone through. Yeah, and I think it's also important to say that um, in no way did we think that, you know, talking to one Haitian woman who both had the personal and academic experience that that would um, mitigate, you know, everything that 
all the ignorance that we had. Um, we also, as a team, talked a lot about prioritizing, um, you know, Haitian activists and Black activists and, um, you know, the voices of, of people themselves. Um, and, you know, just that's part of the, the struggle in trying to do your due diligence when a lot of newsrooms also do not have um, Black or Haitian reporters, which I think is a different conversation, but also tied to the larger systemic um, issues that we do talk about in the podcast. And, and uh, can I can I add something to that? Because that's one of the reasons I, I found this project so exciting is that it wasn't just TPR staff. I mean, it was multiple news outlets, multiple editors, people with different perspectives. I think what we had, um, I mean, <laughs> this the, the the production process on this is literally spanned continents um, from South America and North America. We have. Um, uh, uh, we have our editor Elisa Barba, who's uh, out of uh, who's out of San Diego. So there were a lot of 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 voices and and hands in this making this possible. And I feel like that that type of perspective is just it's 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 so important to have that many different voices and ideas as part of this to kind of making sure that you know the that that things stay grounded in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, I, I want to make sure that we do get time to hear from the audience, but um, I want to know, as Joey just talked about, there's so much movement happening in this story, um, both um, geographically, but also, um, you know, I imagine that a lot of us have changed and shifted since the beginning of this process. And I would like to know from each of you, how has the story moved you all? So I, I can go first. So I, I was very excited to learn um, just so much that I didn't already know about uh, the Haitian experience that, you know, From from the from the narrative that we've seen about Haiti, leading up to the earthquake and the assassination of their president, uh, which I believe was last year, um, the being a part of this has taught me so much about why Haiti is one of the poorest countries in this hemisphere. But it wasn't always that way. Uh, and then episode four, which comes out today, uh, we talk about how. Haiti became one of the poorest countries in the world uh, and how it was essentially because of France and the United States. Um, and to really learn more about why that was, when you listen to this episode, there are, there are parts that, that were actual, like for me, WTF moments about you know, how the, this prosperous economy uh, in the 1800s ended up becoming what it is now it's it's a a, a country that that can struggle that can struggle to sustain itself to where people have to leave to find other opportunities so uh that that is one of the the things that i i felt most enlightened in learning all of that stefania or elizabeth I think um, for me, it's amazing because because I've I've always loved to do this kind of stories, and it's the first time that I've had the time and kind of the backup to do it. Um, and seeing the result and seeing how like I've received some messages and emails of people really like loving the stories and and. And and I'm I'm really glad that they like it because this is where this is the type of journalism that we all should be doing because numbers are just numbers in the end you know they they don't have a face they don't have a story <laughs> and um, I think last week the, the representative of, of the refugee agency in Mexico said that last year 102 different nationalities went through Mexico migrants 
So this is not going to end. And this is a very unique story, the Haitian story, but I don't think it's the only one. You know, I, I've, I've heard stories of, as, as Elizabeth said, Syrians and Afghans who've been fleeing and they were deported to Turkey and then came back. And it's, it's, it's just massive and, and never ending. And unless we do our jobs, no one who the guys who call the shots are not going to do anything because that's that's kind of our the one the one and only thing we can do so um yeah i think that's that's what moved me um thank you um i think also just the the raw optimism just like when you talk to people who are like truly down and out, um, like I am about to like cry because like my car won't start or something like that. And, you know, like people who are just like smiling and and having like joking around in, in pretty, uh, I, I don't know, face, facing potential death directly ahead of them and marching forward just to have like so much respect and um admiration and um I feel like in inspired um uh, by folks so I would say that's along with I think both what Joey and Stephanie has said that would be another thing that I think has changed me and is one of the reasons why I enjoy covering immigration um it's actually full of hope hmm. And one of my favorite quotes is that hope is a discipline, which I think um, if I'm, you know, I've been a part of this team throughout this process as well. And that's what really has moved me is continuing to see how um, hope does lead people, but also it's often like just destroyed and rejected. And it's still like, for some reason, pops up in people's hearts. And I think that, um, it's one thing to see, you know, your family go tell you their immigration stories as, you know, a daughter of and niece and, you know, um, two Mexican immigrants. It's a it's a lot to it's a it's a whole nother thing to continue seeing different people from um, completely different parts of the world all telling you that they are that even if they were sent back or deported, they would make the same journey 10 more times. Um, I would. I don't think that there's any questions right now from the audience, but I would like to, um, again, encourage anybody to please um, put their questions or comments in the Facebook chat. We would really take any question. Um, in the meantime, I would like to show um, the audience some some pictures of the people that we have been following. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Oops. Can everybody see my screen? Is it loading? Not yet. I think we're still loading. One thing I want to say is that um, um, this is Dashka um, and her son Lewinsky. Um, as we, we touched on, Dashka is one of the main people that we have been following and that Stephania has stayed in touch with since uh, September and that she has gotten the chance to go back and see and continue developing a relationship with. And this is her cute little boy, Lewinsky, who you also hear from in the, in the podcast. Um, this is Dashka on the Rio Grande when you know, Stephania first saw her and um, Stephania was really drawn to her because, you know, like we talked about, it was a very chaotic and private moment that most people wanted to just do their thing making sure that they survive and that they find a place and that they can do what they came there to do and 
Dashka turned around and smiled when she saw a camera. So Stefania was definitely um, drawn to her. Um, these are some of the photos from the Houston Chronicle from uh, Maria de, de, de Jesus. Um, these incredible photos that she um, took both um, in Texas and Mexico and also in Colombia. There is also so much, um, so many more photos to see in Elizabeth's digital piece um, on the Houston Chronicles website. And finally, I don't know if this will, has it popped up yet? I think my photos, my computer's a little slow. Um, so something interesting that you will learn about in episode five is that Stephanie and I got off a plane this morning after seeing Dashka. Um, she, I met her for the first time and, um, you know, after learning about her for months and trying to create a cohesive piece about her story, she was, you know, just as lovely as um, I had been reading and hearing, but um, please tune in to episode five to see where not only Dashka is now, but also where John Baptiste and John Son um, Sonny Eugene are and everybody else that we have been following. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. And um, Paloma, are there any questions in, in the audience? Not so far. Okay. Well, um, still more than happy to take any questions. Um, in the meantime, I also want to once again thank Lila, Svensson, UT, everybody else at UT Austin, um, and especially Dr. Pineda Franco and Paloma Diaz for making this event happen. We are so grateful to you on behalf of everybody at. Texas Public Radio and the Houston Chronicle. So thank you so much for having us and for helping us push out this information. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you to Stefania, Elizabeth, and Joey for sharing your experience in working with this series. And um, I do think that you're right, that good journalism should also take the narrative side um, the, the stories, the intimate stories of people, because that's where everything lies. And um, we would see the world differently if we would understand people at that level of, 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 of connection. You know? So we will be um, attentive to the episodes and um, congratulations. Uh, somebody is asking, where are they now? Yeah. No. Um, yeah. So like Elizabeth said, we'll have that update um, specifically where everybody that we have been um, following and mentioning throughout the podcast will get closure, more closure to their stories in episode five, but also understanding that um, this is an ever moving story like everybody here touched about and that they were never really in limbo. Um, there was always a, a place for them to, oh, always a place that they were navigating, but also um, that there is hopefully some hope and um, some more closure to each each person's story. So definitely tune into episode five. We will. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you awesome. again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.